Thank you very much uh, for coming back from your tea coffee break. My name is Ashok Gulati. I'm director in Asia for IFPRI, and we have an exciting panel here. Uh, we are likely to be discussing on what the economic levers are to make a change in agriculture, nutrition, and health linkages particularly. And I have three distinguished speakers with me here. Olivia Ecker, postdoctoral fellow, Development Strategy and Governance Division of IFRI. Carl Greenwich, no, he is missing here, right? Yes. <clears throat> so William Masters, Professor of Food Policy, Friedman School of Nutrition Science and Policy, Tufts University, and Richard Tiffin, uh, Director, Center for Food Security, University of Reading, UK. And then we have a lady who is going to do the uh, toughest job of all, uh, Marcy, who is going to be uh, recording everything, literally, what uh, these speakers have to say. Now, to set the ball rolling, we have one and a half hour, and my suggestion is if speakers can speak for 10 minutes each so that we have ample discussion, and I'll take only two minutes to start with and maybe three minutes towards the end in wrapping up uh, the whole discussion. If I may take the liberty of uh, drawing on what the Prime Minister in his inaugural address said, and he gave us a framework to really look into uh, this issue of agriculture, nutrition, and health. And he talked about uh, issues of availability, which meant not only just increasing production of uh, agricultural goods, but also, more importantly, he emphasized the role of marketing, especially in the high-value perishable commodities, is very critical, which is all a part of availability uh, segment of uh, food security. The second, he also emphasized that just increasing production or doing the marketing is not enough. The people have to have economic access to that food. And that is an issue of how do we uh, make sure that the food that is available is not only for the rich, but also the mass bottom can have access to it. And that is where many of the economic levers of safety nets uh, will start perhaps uh, kicking in. And the third part, uh, he also emphasized that uh, there is an absorption issue. So even if people have access and take the food, but if there are other constraints like uh, not enough clean drinking water or other sanitation facilities, the absorption of that food to result into good nutrition and health of the people is going to be a major challenge. And if you permit, FAO also talks about the fourth little component of bringing about stability into this entire food system. The vulnerability part, the shocks, the exogenous shocks, either coming from drought sometimes or even global prices, how they can unsettle uh, the issue of uh, economic access in particular and therefore uh, affect the nutrition and health of the people. So if we have this broader framework of food, nutritional security, and uh, health. This particular session is going to discuss more and more about economic levers that can be used to attain uh, some of these results. And when we talk about economic levers, it could be price policies, it could be fiscal policies, taxation and subsidy policies, even monetary policies. What levers are there? So my request to the speakers would be if they can identify from the broad general economic policy framework what specific policies and if they have some examples of best policies that can trigger a major change and link these things uh, together so that we have an integrated approach to this entire issue of uh, agriculture, nutrition, and health, uh, that would be very help, uh, helpful for us to report back in the last session where all uh, levers of change uh, would be reported uh, in the plenary. With these opening remarks, I would like to invite now the first speaker, Olivia Ecker. Floor is yours for 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashok. Um, 
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I will basically look at um, the growth policies, the nutritional impact of growth policies, economy-wide growth policies, but also especially in the agriculture sector. Nutrition is increasingly recognized as an important dimension of economic development, yet relatively little is known about the nutritional impacts of economic growth and specific economic policies. While I think advancing this knowledge can help policymakers to develop strategies and prioritize their actions, which are at the same time more pro-nutrition and accelerate economic growth. My and my colleague research shows that growth is good, but it's not enough to improve nutrition. I will first present a brief overview of our study and the main results, and I will discuss in particular which growth policies, but also investments and programs are needed to improve nutrition in its various dimensions effectively. So we started first with a cross-country uh, analysis where we basically looked at the general relationship between economic growth, agriculture growth, and nutrition outcomes. As nutrition outcomes, we used basically the prevalence of undernourishment and the prevalence of child stunting. So prevalence of undernourishment are this, the simple um, FAO measures, and the prevalence of stunting is a long-term indicator of child malnutrition. We found that in general, as we would expect, growth is good for nutrition. But we also see that some countries significantly deviate from the long-term growth uh, nutrition trend, and some countries even have seen nutrition deteriorate despite growth. So from this, two key research questions emerge. First, in what way and to what extent does growth actually contribute to nutrition outcomes? And second, and more important, how can policies, economic policies, be designed to better leverage growth for nutrition improvements? To explore these two research questions in more detail, we uh, did two country case studies. The two countries we chose are Yemen and Malawi. These two countries differ significantly in their economic structure. Yemen is an oil-based economy with a relatively small agricultural sector, while Malawi has an high or uh, a wide agriculture-based uh, economy with limited diversity within the agricultural sector, but also economy-wide. And in addition, the nutrition challenges of these countries differ inherently. In Yemen, we see that child malnutrition, and particularly the severe forms of child malnutrition, are extremely widespread. While in Malawi, especially micronutrient deficiencies, deficiencies in iron, vitamin A, folate, and zinc, are of particular concern. We developed an innovative um, analytical framework where we combine economy-wide models, especially com uh, dynamic computable general equilibrium models, with um, nutrition models at the household and at the individual levels. We use this framework to uh, run certain policy simulations. These policy simulations or the policy scenarios are consistent with the strategies of the particular countries. And we take a forward-looking perspective, so basically we look to the next 10 years, so from today, or the next nine years, from today to 2020. In Yemen, in Yemen, we look particularly at agriculture growth policies and uh, a policy which promotes basically growth in promising industry and service sectors, while in Malawi, we take more an agriculture focus given the economic structure of this country, and here we look particularly at staple-based growth versus broad-based growth. Staple-based growth means maize, mainly maize-driven growth. Okay, let me present some of our key findings. First, growth, and this is also consistent with our country case studies, growth leads to significantly reduced calorie deficiency as we would expect. 
However, depending on the economic structure of the country and the characteristics of the minority population, agriculture, and this is important, or non-agriculture growth can be better for improving nutrition. In agriculture-based economies like Malawi, where agriculture contributes a high share to uh, the cross domestic product and where most of the malnourished population draw their income from agriculture, agriculture has of course a higher potential to improve the nutrition of these people. On the other side, in countries like in Yemen, where agriculture has a relatively small share and farmers are not the most malnourished population, uh, growth in certain industry and service sectors is uh, better for improving nutrition. In addition, um, in economies like in Yemen, where most of the food and especially staple foods are imported, the price effect from uh, agricultural productivity growth on nutrition is relatively low. In addition, what we see is that the role of growth in improving nutrition shifts during the development process. At early stages of development, agriculture growth, and particularly staple-based growth, is critical. But uh, as the de as a, uh, development progresses, economic diversi diversification within the agriculture sector, but also uh, economy-wide, gains in importance. However, and this is key, and I would like to emphasize this, neither agriculture growth nor non-agriculture growth is sufficient to improve child nutrition effectively and broadly and reduce micronutrient malnutrition in all its dimensions. Especially child stunting and certain micronutrient deficiencies, such as vitamin A deficiency, are less responsive to household income growth and therefore also less responsive to economic growth. Therefore, we say that any policy reform needs to be accompanied by strategic investments and targeted programs to tackle child malnutrition and micronutrient deficiencies directly and effectively. Here, investments in the health and education sector, nutrition and health and information and education campaigns, and programs that focus on child and maternal health and nutrition, particularly, as we have heard before, during pregnancy and infancy are key. Investments, if we are talking about investments, we figured out that, for instance, investments um, beside health and education, which means particularly primary education, showed in our model to be highly significant, but also investments in infrastructure, particularly the drinking water system and uh, sanitation, is important, particularly for improving child malnutrition. And this makes sense because children are maybe more exposed to certain diseases. Nutrition and health and information education campaigns are needed in, I would say, basically three areas, or primarily in these three areas. This is um, child feeding practices, especially breastfeeding. The second one is uh, campaigns which leads to a more diversified diet. And the third one are uh, campaigns which promote a better hygiene within the households. While evidence shows that these investments have high economic returns in most of all cases, we have heard that, re that they require political will and, of course, they also require financial resources, which links back to the role of uh, economic growth in improving nutrition. Thank you.